The Prem is a distinguished engineer at, um, at Barclays, in, uh, uh, working out of the US, and I'm very happy that he's here, so please give him a very warm welcome. introduction. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be back here. I was here last year and uh, this year I'm going to be talking more about microservices and our journey. You know, um, For those of you who were here last year, um, I'll try and make sure that I, I, I don't stress on the things that I did last year, but there are some portions uh, that I have to uh, you know, uh, talk about because we're still working with Axon, we're still working with all of the good things that Alad uh, mentioned in his um, uh, in his talk before this. Um, <coughs> there you go, it works. So I'll start with uh, briefly describing our journey. I had covered this last year, uh, but I'm going to do a very abridged version of what I did last year so that we can go to bigger, better things. Now, what we did last year was we talked about how uh, Barclays uh, started with this, this large monolith, you know, with like most, most, most organizations. Barclays in the UK is a 325 year old organization, but uh, Barclays in the US is a lot uh, younger than that, you know. We started as Juniper Bank in 2001 or 2002, predating me. I started at Barclays uh, in 2014, end of 2014. And my journey with, with Axon uh, also started at around that time when our CIO came to us and said, you know, uh, you, uh, we've got this, this framework called Axon, which I'd never heard about at that time, and said, we should try experimenting with this to see how we can build our new consumer lending business on top of that. We were a credit card business exclusively until that time. And, uh, and we were just going to start onboarding a new consumer lending business and our CIO was convinced that uh, instead of building on top of what we had already, we should build something afresh and migrate our existing stuff onto, uh, onto the new stuff. And uh, four years later, or three years later, um, consumer lending is running in production, has been for the last 18 months, successfully, I might add. And, uh, and right now, uh, the mission for me is to migrate portions of our credit card business onto, uh, on, onto uh, the frameworks and uh, ecosystem that we've built. So we started here, and we've moved to what looks like this. This is a very simplified picture of what we have today. But what you need to, uh, uh, need to pay attention to is the fact that now we have a bunch of these services in the middle, which we call core or domain or you know uh, command services. They are the heart of our system. They they form the the core APIs. They expose all of the the main business logic uh, that uh, that Barclays does as part of the lending business and as part of the cart business. Now, uh, surrounding these, you'll see a whole bunch of gateways, right? And those gateways are, are the anti-corruption uh, layer for us. So you've got a bunch of legacy systems, partner systems, vendor systems, processors, and so on. And, and these gateways shield us from, from, uh, uh, from those systems. In between, what we have is, is the event-driven part. We said that in our previous system, Everything knew about everything, and that became uncontrollable after a point. And uh, so we said this time when we're going to do uh, uh, this afresh, we are trying to risk, we are going to restrict ourselves to uh, to creating services that do not have uh, a large number of dependencies. In fact, we said they'll have only two dependencies. One, it's their own database, and another is this event bus. Only two. Everything else will consume events or produce events. So that way they are, at least in theory, loosely coupled. So this is what I covered last, last year mostly. 
And if you want to look at more information, you can go uh, look at the YouTube video that is uploaded from last year, and it will give you more information on how we actually got from the monolith to, to where we are here today. But that's where 2018 starts. Like, this is supposed to be the end, but turns out that it's not, right? You know, so there have been quite a few slippery uh, slopes, and uh, I'm still here, which means that we might be doing something right. You know, so we still have a long way to go. So the way that I'll, um, I'll, I'll structure this talk is that I've got 10 things that I want to talk about. Some of those may have been, uh, may have been covered as part of what Alad said and what Russ said before this. Uh, but these are questions that have come uh, repeatedly to me, you know, as, as one, of the, one of the leads on this, on this program uh, over the last three years. Uh, I've got these questions repeatedly about our systems. You know, because every time you say domain-driven design or CQRS or event sourcing or, uh, or location transparency and things of that sort, people have, I guess, naturally a, a, a predictable set of questions. And I've ordered them in, in, the, uh, in, in a way that the most frequently asked questions appear first. Okay. So the first one is DDD. Right, so we have endeavored to to use DDD as the core tenet of our of of our services. Right now, if you're thinking DDD, you're probably thinking domain-driven design. Right, but uh, in reality, though, domain-driven design actually translates to data transfer object-driven design. You know, so I guess it's it's somehow natural for us to do this now, or it has become natural for us to do this, where you create a, uh, an object, and then the first thing you, uh, you, you know, through muscle memory, I think, do is to create getters and setters for those objects. Uh, maybe it's, it's Java developers who do that, maybe Ruby developers never do that, but, you know, uh, uh, but, but that's where we were, you know, where we said domain-driven design, but that would, you know, in, ter in, in real terms, translate into a bunch of a data transfer objects, and what I mean by that is, you've got request objects. You transfer, you uh, convert them into uh, commands. You then uh, you convert them into events. So there are lots of transformation that happens, right? But but it's important for us to understand why why we are doing this, right? And this is something that I've, I've I've tried to tell our teams as well. We are doing this because we want services to encapsulate data. We want those services to protect the data. That's why we are doing this. There's no point in just exposing your database, right? If you want to do that, you probably want to just give them, give your users a SQL editor. Maybe that's good enough, right? The the second thing is, we, as developers, architects, have this obsession with with REST. You know, I mean, it's it's somehow fashionable to say that we are building RESTful services. Um, and, and, you know, so the question is, what do you mean by REST? Is it resources? Is it hypermedia? Uh, is it something else? Uh, is it um, hideous links? No, it, it, it turns out that REST, we somehow as, as developers and architects or tech people have this obsession on, uh, on the URL, right? The URL format is everything. So. Uh, so we've had quite a few debates about that, about how domain-driven design and REST somehow contradict each other, where REST is all about, uh, you know, just CRUD methods, you've got the get, post, put, delete, and, and how domain-driven design is all about encapsulating behavior. So, so we basically is, it's not a REST contest, right? It's more important, at least for me, to encapsulate data. If you also happen to be restful, good on you. If you are not restful, it's okay. <laughs> but then DDD, right? I mean, the, we, we started with saying that all of our core services will, will adopt uh, DDD. And, um, and that actually means not just you know, the, uh, the technology parts of it, the entities and the value objects and the repositories and the, uh, and the services, but it's also about, about co-locating with your business stakeholders, 
you know so but if your business is is very uh, then then you probably don't need all of this right if your business changes too infrequently or doesn't change at all right maybe you don't need this but this for us when we were dealing with with what felt like a complex uh, uh, business we 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 basically said we are going to adopt this because we suffered from a problem of having business logic spread across all our systems right from the ui to the back end to the database to the integration layer wherever we we could put data uh, business logic we had put it in in our previous system and we suffered from that so we said we want to concentrate all of our business logic in the business tier in the services tier and that's why we said we would consciously do that so that was our first first reason to say ddd number 2 So, our services looked like this, and you saw this diagram. It's a much more simplified version of the previous diagram that I showed you. And we went one step ahead, and we broke down our services into commands and queries. So we have got one service which exclusively does the job of of uh, handling commands, and it does nothing else. It handles commands and it publishes out events. If you want to make queries, you've got a separate service. And, and, and that's a completely different process that, that services those, those kinds of requests. Now, this has been a, a, a very controversial thing for us, internally at least, you know, where people think that CQRS is this, is this very niche thing. You know, so uh, I, I think there was this joke going around, where, uh, it was true, I think, where when you Googled for CQRS, it, Google would ask you if you meant cars, right? And, and that mentality uh, continues even today, right? Somehow CQRS is, is seen as, as, this, um, uh, as this very niche thing that only, the, only the, uh, the, the cool cats do. But I don't think that's necessarily true, right? CQRS, by definition, is very, very simple. Instead of having uh, one interface, you have two interfaces now. One interface just deals with making changes to the state of your system, and another that makes inquiries of the state of your system. It's as simple as that. So, and, and, the, and the command side is, is, is obviously powered by, by Axon. On, in our systems, the query side is completely oblivious of Axon. When we started with Axon 2, uh, we had bundled both of these into one physical uh, service, but in, uh, in, in the second iteration of what we did, we broke them down into, uh, into commands and queries as two separate things, because we, we saw that, uh, you know the the interference between command and query would actually hinder our our ability to either process commands or service queries. Most likely, process commands because we had a lot of uh, queries coming in at a much more uh, rapid rate than commands. So CQRS was all about about the separation. So we actually split them out into two separate physical units. So the question is why. I spoke about the, f the fact that we have a difference in volumes. In our case, when we did some tests, uh, the ratio in favor of queries was 40 to 1, right? And, and, and that gave us a good enough indication that you know, we should probably do this physically as opposed to just uh, restricting ourselves to, to it being logical uh, portions in the same service. It does allow, uh, CQRS does allow uh, you know, much stronger encapsulation, and I, I'll keep harping on that because because remember we said it's uh, our our natural tendency these days is to write DTOs, right? But with help from Axon, when you write your domain object, you don't have to write accessors at all, right? You obviously have the choice to do it, but there is no need for you to do it. You you have business methods, and those business methods publish events. There is no need to say, get me the value of, of this attribute, at least from that representation. <coughs> so in that sense, it allows us to build something that is extremely tightly encapsulated. And that was a big aha moment for me personally. Right? Previously, when I was working with non-CQRS or more conventional systems, it was impossible to do because hiding the data 
was impossible because you would need that data to be displayed somewhere, which means that you uh, that you needed to now expose that data out. And once you have exposed the data, it allows you to to um, uh, to operate on the data outside of the of the core system that you've built. Which means that now the UI can do this thing where let's say I've got a, a service which exposes the 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 location of your home in coordinates and the location of your computer when trying to apply for a new card, right? Now, I can, if I give you the, the two locations, the, the consumer can now use the, that piece of data to, to compute the distance between the two, which can then be used in a validation. Whereas now, if I send you just the location, I can't operate on the underlying data, and it allows me the freedom to change the underlying data with a lot more freedom. So, so this was something that was a big, big aha moment for me when working with CQRS and Axon-based systems. But you know, it's not it's it's not always. Uh, it's not always something that that you can use as a as a silver bullet. There's always caveats. If you're not the system of record, what do I mean by that? Right, stay away. So in our case. We are the consumer lending uh, system. So customers come to us to get a loan. But then what we do is we process uh, those loans at a, at, a, at a loan processor, which is external to us. We are, in, in, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, a front end to either a loan processing system or a, or a credit card processing system. So when you swipe your card, you're actually telling a, a processor system that you swiped your card. We then come to know of that fact after. Whereas when you make an address change, we are the first ones to know that you've made an address change. And then we tell other systems. So if you are the system of record, then all of the validations that surround that, uh, that operation can be part of your system or should be part of your system. Whereas if it happens as part of a different system, then you are just being told. There is nothing you can do uh, but, but to accept what the other system is telling you as reality. So, CQR doesn't make sense, or will you find it really hard to implement when you are not the system of record? So the other thing is again, if you've got business logic that is really really simple, um, you know you probably don't don't really need it. Uh, if if you know if you're displaying uh, data in very predictable ways, you probably don't need it. Number three. Another source of controversy for us is, is event sourcing. You know, event sourcing is this thing where we don't store the state of an entity uh, like you would do in a, in a conventional system. We store the events in our database. So the system of record has not state, but just events, deltas of what has happened. Now this, this again has been very controversial for us because people, uh, People feel again this is something that's overly complicated, but in reality it's not. We have been dealing with this for uh, for ages now. Our databases have been doing this for however long, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, and and everything seems fine. Whereas when we do this in a more conventional business system, uh, it, it somehow raises uh, alarm bells, and and this was something that that obviously uh, you know. Uh, was was away from the beaten path, so it, it definitely did uh, uh, did you know raise concerns for people who were outside of the team. But for us, it felt very very natural. <coughs> the question is again, why why are we doing this? We are a bank, right? And we need to audit everything that we do. We also need to prove what changed in our system. So which means that we have a, a ready audit of whatever has happened in the past. It also allows us uh, to to cache everything. I mean, this is underestimated, you know. So we recently wrote a, a, a system where we we ingest a whole bunch of transactions that are happening on on uh, uh, on, on our customers' accounts, and then we calculate on the fly what benefits that might give you. Previously, what we would do is we would do it at the end of a 30-day cycle. So we would have a back job which would run at the end of the 30 days and then tell you, you shopped at this gas station, 
you shopped at this uh, at this Walmart, and because you know you you've done this, you get uh, a, you know uh, 50 cents off, or you get a, a, a much better APR rate. But now we are able to do this in real time, and and caching, and we're dealing with something like uh, close to 20 million transactions every single day, right? Again, I mean, this is not Google-esque, this is not netflix -esque, but but it's still, for, for a bank our size, it's still pretty, uh, pretty unprecedented, uh, you know, where we are doing all of this in real time. And we have tested it for a much higher number to make sure that if it does uh, grow, uh, you know, that, that the system will continue to perform. So caching is something that, that you get out of the box because you're, you're storing immutable data, which means that they, that data can be cached forever if, if you choose to. The, second, the third thing that, that this allows us to do is, is to represent data in, in ways that were not possible to be predicted. So a manager comes to me and says, you know what, Prem, we need, uh, we need a summarized uh, version of, of this same data. It allows us to now do this thing called a replay, where we replay all of those historic events and that is uh, something that's fairly academic or fairly straightforward to do with, with Axon. And, and now you've got a new view, a materialized view, just specifically tailored for the purposes of, of that uh, use case that you have. And this is very, very straightforward to do, whereas in a state-based system, uh, you're probably scrambling to, do, uh, to f figure out what to do. Again, you know, so the, the thing with, with uh, uh, even sourcing is that you're storing an a, a, a immutable set of events, an immutable ordered set of events, which means that over a course of time, you're going to accumulate a lot of events for specific uh, uh, instances. So in some cases, uh, you know, if, if you're a very, uh, very heavy user of your credit card, uh, you know, we recently saw that a person was, was doing a thousand transactions a day. Right, and that felt like, oh my God! I mean, how how can somebody do thousand credit card transactions in a day, right? And and it was slowing down our our, our system, you know, because now you have to load all of those thousand events first, then replay every single one of them, and then finally arrive at arrive at at the at domain state. Uh, in this case, it turned out that it was it was actually a fraudulent account. What they were trying to do was they were trying to make really really small transactions on Alibaba.com like five cents, seven cents. Uh, but previously, we, we, I mean, we, we stumbled on this because you know, it, it slowed down the, the load of our domain objects. Uh, thankfully, there were not too many of them. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but in some cases, snapshots might not be an option for you. you know, because, uh, uh, so what we did to, to get, get rid of that problem was to, was to snapshot. And again, Axon provides, uh, provides us with the uh, with the machinery to, to create snapshots so that now if you've got a thousand events, you can define that uh, criteria to say after every five events, create a snapshot of, the, of that domain object so that you're only loading at the most five events at any time. But sometimes snapshots may not be an option for you or maybe too expensive for you because, uh, because your domain objects keep changing too often, which means that, uh, which means that your events keep changing too often, uh, which means that you have to invalidate your snapshots. So if that is the case for you, maybe you should go look uh, look elsewhere. I think Axon DB probably has a, 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 a or has on the roadmap an elegant way to deal with this problem. Uh, right now, uh, you know, we we use snapshotting pretty aggressively, and 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 that keeps us uh, you know uh, keeps load times uh, predictable for us. The next one is uh, it might be a bit amusing. I mean, if, you know, I. I put it there because, um, because at the bank, when we buy storage, we apparently buy storage that is so expensive that, that people are, um, are conscious of the fact that we ask for more and more storage. Uh, in, a, in a safe store, you're overwriting the same data. So, uh, so, you're not, you know, so if you're updating, uh, you're, not, you're not adding more and more uh, uh, disk space requirements. Whereas in an in a immutable event store, uh, you, you keep accumulating more and more data and it feels uncontrollable at times. So if you are here, I'm sorry, uh, but, uh, but it's uh, in some cases a real, real problem. The third thing is, 
you know, and this applies to not just uh, not just uh, event sourcing. It applies to everything that I've said uh, before, right? If you are afraid of 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 explanation fatigue, right? There have been uh, positively a, a, a very very large number of times when I've had to repeat this exact same thing, sometimes to the same people, uh, because uh, you know they I guess tend to forget or they tend to uh, uh, you know I don't know what it is. Maybe they didn't understand it when I said it. And maybe I didn't say it right. Uh, so so if you are afraid of explanation fatigue, probably not the not the right thing for you. All right. So, um, atomic operations, right? This thing keeps coming up again and again and again, right? We've got a whole bunch of uh, systems that are distributed. You know, how do you how do you make sure that you do things atomically? Uh, so, right now, what we have is this: you've got a command processing service, like I mentioned, and those services have two dependencies, like I again mentioned. There is the event store, and then there is the event bus. You issue a command, and then you emit out events. Now, the, this part, right, the storing of the event into the event store, and the publishing of the event onto the bus, have to be done atomically. If you don't do it atomically, or then there is a possibility that your data is inconsistent. Uh, because imagine the situation you have um, the only way to tell others that you've done something interesting is by publishing an event. If you didn't publish an event but stored it in a database, then nobody will know. So anything that is that is dependent on that event having happened will not know at all that it happened, and so you've got uh, you've got inconsistency in your system overall. If you publish the event but did not store it in a database, that's probably even worse uh, because now. Uh, that the main object is in a is in an inconsistent state itself, uh, and everything after that may not work at all. So it is very important for us to do this uh, atomically. At Barclays uh, in the U.S., we we make use of um, uh, Oracle as our as our uh, event store. You know, not the uh, the the most glamorous option, but you know it does the job. Uh, and we use ActiveMQ as our event bus. Now, in that case, uh, what we did was we, we first experimented with um, uh, with distributed transactions, uh, but we couldn't really scale distributed transactions to uh, to work, uh, you know, at the level of uh, performance that we wanted. Especially with those transaction uh, options, we just could not get it to uh, process near real time. The requirement was that I swipe my card, we get to know. And then uh, milliseconds later, I need to tell the uh, customer that uh, you know, hey, you've got this benefit, right? And uh, and when you've got millions of uh, transactions happening in real time, it's really really hard uh, to uh, to do this with distributed transactions. Or at least we couldn't get it to work. So what we did was we did we we faked it. So we uh, what I mean by that is uh, you know we. Uh, ActiveMQ, you know, uh, creates a JMS transaction. Oracle creates a database transaction, and we use uh, Spring Magic. Uh, there is something called a Chain Transaction Manager, and that Chain Transaction Manager allows us to uh, simulate distributed transactions. Uh, there is a, a failure window, but but you know, even if you were using distributed transactions uh, after the booting phase, there is still a, 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 a failure window. So it wasn't as if you we were making it worse. It's just that we were not using formal distributed transactions, and and uh, and it was also a lot less ceremony uh, to to deal with. Uh, there are other other systems. I mean, uh, you know, like uh, there is a there is a, a similar uh, competitor, I guess, to Axon called Eventuate. What they have done is they have taken a different approach where they uh, uh, they say MySQL is is the is the is the data store that they support, and they tail the MySQL uh, redo logs, and then they publish events out of that. I mean, that's something that uh, that Axon also does now with 3.3.x. Uh, uh, we are not using that feature yet, uh, but it is an option. We actually tried to use it with MongoDB, uh, but we had some scale issues, so we. Uh, so we, we we scaled it back to uh, Oracle and and the and the faking after your distributed transactions approach. 
uh, but it might be something that, uh, that uh, you know, if you're using Axon 3, that's an option for you. And finally, you know, the other option, the best option in my mind, is to use just one component which acts as both the event store and the event bus, which is what, I guess, Axon uh, server is now trying to be. Right, so, so that definitely is something that, uh, that you should definitely take a look at, because it makes it a lot more simpler, because you don't have to deal with two things when you can deal with just one. Number five, um, this seems like a very innocuous thing, you know, so when you're working with, a, with an Axon-based system, uh, you have to make the choice of an aggregate route. And that choice, if you make the wrong choice, it can come hurt you pretty bad. I mean, this is one thing that, uh, that uh, you know, we um, initially, maybe it was naivety, maybe it was ignorance, uh, or maybe it was uh, overconfidence, what have you. We did get it wrong a few times, at least initially. And uh, getting it wrong, uh, in our case, before we went live, we realized that it, this, is, this is proving to be too hard uh, to deal with the wrong aggregate route. And, and we were able to recover. But if we had done this after we had gone live, I think it would have been a lot more challenging because we would have had to migrate events. We would have had to, uh, uh, you know, change the way that uh, downstream systems react. Uh, so, so there is work. So, so one thing that I would say is when you're making the choice of an aggregate route for a service, uh, make sure that you have involved uh, people who have feedback, uh, people who have experience with uh, uh, with working with a system like this. Uh, there is no such thing as uh, as uh, as uh, not asking enough people, especially when it comes to this decision. This is a critical decision, or at least in our case it was, and we felt that it, uh, you know, if we if it made them it made a mistake, it would have been a lot more expensive. Uh, and then the other thing is is actually practice domain driven design, right? You know, so domain driven design is not about all of the technology. It is also, in a sense, about about sitting with your uh, domain experts. You know, so listen to them. You know, so they usually have uh, lots of good insights, and they might give you things that uh, cause you to reconsider how you have uh, thought of the system. Um, the other thing is, you know, uh, this might be something that you do at in the early phases of of of, uh, uh, of conceptualizing uh, a new bit of functionality, uh, do these sessions which are called event storming. Last year, Alberto was here, and uh, and he he did a, an event storming system, and that was when I saw it in action for the first time. And I wish we had done that more, uh, you know, when we did our initial <coughs> sessions. Uh, so so definitely recommend you know doing. Uh, event storming uh, sessions with your business and your technical experts, both in the same room. And of course, the obvious thing is you just just get better at uh, at it after you have done it a few times, right? Number seven or six is uh, is eventual consistency, right? I I I should have put this at number one actually, you know. Uh, uh, Eventual consistency is, it's, it's a reality in, in most systems. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with a third party, right, if you're dealing with a, with a system that is not your own, then, um, uh, then you're, you're, you're actually um, dealing with a system that is eventually consistent. Somehow, it gets a lot of uh, press or bad press. Um, uh, you know, in, in a in a distributed system like this one, but but it's it's something that that uh, if you if you if it's too hard, it means that you have probably got something fundamentally wrong, and everything that I said before this about DDD is probably what you need to uh, uh, need to focus on. Apparently, I'm running out of time, uh, so uh, I'll talk about this. This is completely orthogonal to to the subject that we're talking about. Uh, it's about contract testing. Right, and this has very little to do with Axon itself, but it has to do with the fact that you uh, that you're trying to do um, to uh, to do microservices or services that are uh, focused doing one thing, which means that you don't have one microservice ever. Right, you have an ecosystem of microservices which then collaborate together. If you um, uh, 
if you if you want to uh, to deal with them as true microservices uh, this step right contract testing specifically consumer driven contract testing so you've got http based apis and you've got uh, uh, event based apis now both of those need to be contract tested so imagine this where i've got um, a, a, a client or i've got several clients and they're all contributing their expectations of what they uh, what they want me the producer uh, to confirm to and if that is codified i know when making changes to the uh, to the api that i'm producing if i'm making uh, changes that are safe enough and from the consumer side it frees me from the burden of having to run everything in a in an integrated end to end environment and we we did not start with doing this formally uh, and and uh, we are suffering from it in the sense that uh, we still have last deployments you know we 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 uh, deploy all of our microservices uh, as as one big unit because we do not have the confidence to say that if i just change this one microservice and drop it into the ecosystem that everything will work in production so uh, and also we don't have the have the infrastructure to say i want to test more than just the one combination i uh, so currently what we have got is one large integrated qa environment and in that large qa environment there are versions of of each of these services and that's the combination that's known is tested and that's what can move forward so we we still do that as one step it's uh, uh it's it's a lot easier because uh, uh, a lot easier than uh, previously because we still have all of that codified so what we are saying is you've got versions of of uh, of of each of these services and if if those versions haven't changed we don't do anything as part of the deployment step but it's still uh, you know the critics of what we have built say that you know, you've still got a monolithic deployment and they are true in saying that and the answer to uh, to getting away from that is to establish a, a very sound contract testing practice so uh, with that i have three more things but uh, uh, but i'm going to i'm going to stop here uh, uh, right and uh, i'll let the next uh, next speaker get on stage but if you want to know about those other three things that i wanted to talk about uh, i'm i'm still here for today thank you very much